Today I'm going to be talking about the average continued fraction. Um, and in particular, this question up here. What is the expected continued fraction of a uniformly random real number r? Um, and this is by no means rigorous. This is just some things that I've noticed while studying continued fractions. Um, so why do I find this problem interesting? Well, there's many ways to write a number. We might have something like root 2. And we can write this um, in the decimal representation as 1.4142 and so on. Um, and if we pick a random real number and write it as a decimal like this, um, any of these places, for example, the 10th the place, has a 10% chance of being a 0, a 10% chance of being a 1, 10% chance of being a 2, and so forth. Um, it's spread evenly. And, and you could say the same for any of these places. No matter what place you pick, it has a 10% chance of being each of them. But if we write this number in its representation as a continued fraction, which is 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2, continuing on forever, then, writing a continued fraction for a random real number, we don't get that same even distribution. Things act differently, and it's much harder to predict how things um, will act. So, um, let's take a look at that. So first, let's lay out what we mean by a continued fraction. So that's a number of the form n sub 0 plus 1 over n sub 1 plus 1 over n sub 2 plus 1 over n sub 3, and so on. And that continues. And importantly, n sub i, all of these terms, they are integers for all i. And then n sub i are positive for all i that are positive. So, all of these numbers are integers, and with the exception of this first term, they're all positive. And these restrictions are important because it gives us a one-to-one -one correspondence between the real numbers and these continued fractions. For every real number, we have exactly one continued fraction, and vice versa. Um, now, that does mean we have to ignore the rationals, but if we're picking a random real number, it's not going to be rational, so that's okay to ignore. The first thing that we're going to look at is this section here, um, if we remove the n sub 0. So we'll kind of treat this generally, call it x, and we'll say this is something of the form 1 over m sub 1 plus 1 over m sub 2 plus continuing on. So we have a um, a set of these positive integers adding to this x. And what we claim is that this x is between 0 and 1. Now, why is it greater than 0? Why is it positive? Well, all of these m's are positive. So the denominator is positive, the whole number is positive. There's nothing in it that would make it negative. Why is it less than 1? Well, the smallest that this m1 can be is 1, because it's a positive integer. So this is at the very least 1, and then we're adding something positive to it. So the denominator is bigger than 1, which means the fraction itself is less than 1. So we know anything of this form, any x of this form, is between 0 and 1. And an important takeaway from this result, let's say we have a random real number, that is equal to, we'll give it this uh, continued fractional representation. Now we know that this section here is less than 1, greater than 0. So if we round down r, it must be n sub 0, because rounding down makes it an integer, and n sub 0 must be the largest integer that is not greater than r. So that means if we pick a random r, n sub 0 is just the floor of that, um, so it's distributed as if we're just picking a random integer, which isn't a particularly interesting thing to look at, 
Um, so from now on, we're just going to ignore this n sub zero and just deal with the rest of the fraction. And that gives us the nice benefit that we can now say that r is between zero and one, which makes it much more convenient to talk about probability. So now maybe we ask the question, what is the probability that n sub one equals some given integer a? What is this? Well, that means that our number r is equal to one over a, because n sub one is a, plus some x. The rest of this we'll call x. And so what's the largest this could be? Well, that's if x is zero. So one over a is definitely bigger than r. What's the smallest it could be? That's if x is one. So it's bigger than one over a plus one. And these should be bigger than or equal to. Um, and so because the set is from zero to one, we can just write this probability as one over a minus one over a plus one. And then we can give these a common denominator, multiply this by a plus one, and make this a plus one, and then multiply this by a and make this a. Then we see that this negative a cancels with this positive a, and we get one over a times a plus one. So that's our probability that n sub one equals a. And now, before we move on, let's look at that visually. So we'll draw the number line, and let's say this is one, and this is zero. And so when a is one, we're saying that we have to be between one over one, which is one, and one over two. So in this range from a half to one, we're saying this is where n sub one is one. And then if a is two, we get half to a third. So this range um, from a third to a half, n sub one equals two. And then from a fourth to a third, n sub one equals three, and so on. So we can see the most common result for n one is one, and then two, and then three. And as the number gets larger, it becomes less and less likely. Um, now, maybe what's the expected value of that? So this would be the sum as i goes from one to infinity of i times one over i times i plus one, which equals the sum as i goes from one to infinity. Um, these i's will cancel out, so we get i plus one, which equals the sum as i goes from two to infinity of one over i, and we know the harmonic series diverges, so even though the most common value for this is one, and then two, and then three, even though the low values are the most frequent, the expected value is still infinity. Okay, so now we've taken a look at this n1, maybe let's now move on to n2. And we might wonder, in this section where we know that n1 equals one, how is that subdivided? If we break this into sections, like we did here with the whole zero to one, how does that compare to the total? And so what we're really asking is, what is the probability that n sub two equals a, given that n sub one equals one? So again, our number is going to be something of the form one plus one over one plus one over a plus x. So what is the largest that this could be? Well, we want to minimize the denominator, which means we want to maximize this denominator. So x would be one. So we have one over one plus one over a plus one minus, and then to minimize this, we just set x equal to zero. One over one plus one over a. 
And then we're only looking at this half range, so we want to multiply this whole thing by 2. Okay. Now, we'll set this 1 instead to be a plus 1 over a plus 1, and this 1 to be a over a, so that we have a common denominator. And so now we have 2 times 1 over a plus 2 over a plus 1 minus 1 over a plus 1 over a. So we get 2 a plus 1 over a plus 2 minus a over a plus 1. And then get another common denominator. We can square this, make this a squared plus 2a. And then we can multiply these out. Okay. So So bring that up here. We have 2 times a squared plus 2a plus 1 minus a squared minus 2a all over a plus 2 times a plus 1. So this cancels with that, this cancels with that, and we get 2 over a plus 2 times a plus 1. So how does this compare with the overall probabilities? Okay, so let's make a, a table here. Here's A. Here's the probability that N1 equals A, and then the probability that N2 equals A, given that N1 equals 1. So with 1, the probability is a half. And with a as 1, this is 2 over 2 times 3, which is a third. So we see it's actually lower with the conditional probability. With 2, we have 1 over 6. And then 2 over 3 times 4, which is 1 over 6. So 2 is actually the same. And then with 3, we have a 12th is 3 times 4. And then we get 2 times, 2 over 4 times 5. So this is actually a 10. So this is greater now. And with 4, this is a 20th. And then we have 2 over 5 times 6, which is a 15th. Again, greater. And if we continue this, we see that everything from 3 on is greater. 2 is the same. And with 1, this is less. But now that raises the question, what if this is not 1? What about the range with 2, or the range with 3, and, and so on? And we can look at them individually, but perhaps it's best to look at where does this trend towards? What does this look like as this n1 approaches infinity? So what we're looking at is the probability that n2 equals a, given that n1 equals b, and then we're going to let b approach infinity. Okay, so as we saw before, we, we did this with 1, so we'll kind of just replicate that with b instead. So this is going to be the limit as b approaches infinity of 1 over b plus 1 over a plus 1 minus 1 over b plus 1 over a all over the probability that n1 is b, which we know is just 1 over b times b plus 1. Okay, so we'll bring that over here. This equals the limit as b approaches infinity. This is in the denominator, so we can just flip it and pull it up. And we'll actually write this as b squared plus b, distribute the b. And then we get, well, this is 1 over, if we multiply this, a times 1. So b times a plus 1, plus 1 over a plus 1, minus b times a plus 1 all over a. And now we can flip these fractions. 
So this is the limit as b goes to infinity of b squared plus b, a plus 1 over ba plus b plus 1 minus a over ba plus 1. And now we want to get these common denominators so we can subtract them. So we'll say this is the limit as b goes to infinity, b squared plus b times, so a plus 1 times ba plus 1, we get a squared b plus ab plus a plus 1 minus, we're going to take these two and multiply them, so a squared b minus ab minus a, all over ab plus b plus 1 times ab plus 1. Okay, now this cancels with this, this cancels with this, this cancels with this, and we're left with a 1. So this equals the limit as b goes to infinity, I'll pull this onto the top, multiply it by that one, b squared plus b over, and now I'll distribute these out. So we get a squared b squared um, plus a b squared plus a b plus a b plus b plus 1. Okay. Now, we're looking at the limit as b goes to infinity, so we can ignore everything except for the b squareds because those will become negligible. So we'll erase these and this, okay? And so this is equal to the limit as b goes to infinity of b squared over b squared times a squared plus a. The b squared and the b squared cancel out to be 1, and so this is just 1 over a squared plus a, which equals 1 over a times a plus 1, which equals the probability that n equals a. So as b goes to infinity, n2 being a turns into n1 being a. So this chunk a third of this was made up of n2 being 1, but as we move further and further down, that third tends towards a half. And so these smaller and smaller chunks look more and more like the whole picture for the next set down. So now we have n3. We may pose the question of what is the probability that n sub 3 equals a, given that n sub 2 equals b, and n sub 1 equals c. And if we actually let that c and that b tend towards infinity, we see that this equals the probability that n1 equals a. So, if we take another step down, this n3 is again respective of the whole line from 0 to 1 as b and c go to infinity. And we could walk through why this is, but perhaps at this stage it's better to go through this inductively and show this more generally um, so that instead of just looking at the n3 case, we can kind of get a sense for why this is for all cases below. So instead of looking at this specific probability, Maybe we'll look at any given range and see how that's changed as we let these values go to infinity. So to do this, we'll take some numbers x and y, such that they're both real, um, and then we'll say 0 is less than x is less than y is less than 1. And we want to take a look at two ranges. First, we have this line from 0 to 1, where we have x and y, and we have this interval between x and y. 
and it makes a certain proportion of the whole interval from 0 to 1. And we're going to look at another interval that starts at 1 over a plus 1 and ends at 1 over a. And then because we're putting these in the denominator, they will swap. So y will be less. So this will be 1 over a plus y. And this will be 1 over a plus x. And we want to show that the proportion that this makes of this entire interval approaches this proportion as a goes to infinity. So we want to look at the limit as a goes to infinity of the probability that 1 over a plus y is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to 1 over a plus x, given that 1 over a plus 1 is less than or equal to r is less than or equal to 1 over a. So this equals the limit as a goes to infinity of probability that we're in here. So 1 over a plus x minus 1 over a plus y all over the probability that we're in here. 1 over a minus 1 over a plus 1. And we've shown before that this equals 1 over a times a plus 1. 1 over a times a plus 1. And then we can multiply this on top and bottom by a plus y, so a plus y. And then we can multiply this by a plus x. So we're going to multiply these both in the denominator and then keep this subtraction here. This will need to turn into a subtraction. This a cancels with this a, and on the top, we're left with y minus x. Um, so this is the limit as a goes to infinity. This denominator, we can flip, bring it into the numerator. So this is a times a plus 1 times y minus x over a plus x times a plus y. Okay, and now this is the limit as a goes to infinity of a squared, we'll bring this up into the numerator, a squared y minus x plus a y minus x, and then we'll distribute this denominator a squared plus y plus x a plus y x. And now we're setting, we're, we're taking the limit as a goes to infinity, so we only need to pay attention to these a squareds. We'll get rid of these and this. And now the a squared on top and bottom turn into 1, and this equals y minus x, which is the probability that y is greater than or equal to r is greater than or equal to x which is that interval up here. So we've shown that as a goes to infinity, this interval approaches the same proportion as this interval. So now we kind of see that any time we take this to infinity, this inside approaches the same kind of distribution. Whether or not that means that the expected value of n2 is also infinity, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but if you have any ideas on that, let me know in the comments.